Okay, we're back. We have now episode two of the debunking series. Before we dive into it, how are you doing, Mark? Doing well, buddy. How are you doing? I'm great. I can't complain. Anything interesting happening since we chatted last? No, we had the hurricane last mm. weekend, but where we are, it didn't really affect us. It rained a decent amount one day. We had an earthquake during that day, but didn't really affect us. I am starting my first improv class tomorrow. It was supposed to be last Sunday. So, uh, yeah, we'll see how improv goes in the next debunking episode that we do. I'll tell you about it. And maybe my newfound skills will be uh, on display during the podcast. What was the interest in starting improv? I just wanted to try something different. It's, it's six weeks long, three hours per class on Sundays. And I've mentioned to you that I don't think I'm the best at monologues. Like, obviously, we do a lot of YouTube videos, and I'm a pretty good writer. And when there's more structure, I'm, I'm pretty good in that format. But in terms of just kind of talking about things live, not quite as skillful. And someone might say, well, it's because you're not knowledgeable about a topic or you're not prepared about a topic. But this is true if I just met a random person on a park bench and had a conversation with them. It's not always the smoothest conversation. So I thought, hey, maybe this will be a way to improve my conversational skills and maybe I'll get a little bit funnier along the way, you know? Yeah. Maybe this develop the... a character. Like this is how, I don't know if they still do it, but you know, like how characters were developed back in the day where it was an improv, like Pee Wee Herman, you know, was an improv mm -hmm. character and I think developed from there. So that's true. Didn't he just pass away? Probably. Yeah. Anyways, before we get into today's debunking topic on leg extensions, I know you wanted to chat briefly about our first episode. Do you want to start with that? Yeah. So this is also like hopefully the benefit of improv, right? Like maybe I don't have to revisit things, but I've always told students, patients, mentees that if I didn't know the answer to a question, I'd try to find the answer and get back to them. And the last episode about core stability, you asked me, you know, about instability at the ankle and at the shoulder and how that differs from the core. And I felt like I gave an insufficient response. So I want to try to clarify if possible. So I think definitions of instability at the ankle and at the shoulder are probably better defined, more objective. And there's generally more agreement. And we could talk about this with other body regions as well, but obviously want to keep it short. Whereas for the core, you know, we discussed that instability will get thrown around for any instance of pain or perception of someone's bad posture or someone's inability to do a bird dog or the inability to arbitrarily activate the transversus abdominis. And we've had Jay Hurdle on the podcast, who is a giant in the field of ankle research to talk about chronic ankle instability. And he co-authored a great paper with uh, Reve Corbett in 2019 titled An Updated Model of Chronic Ankle Instability. And in it, they write, chronic ankle instability is a condition characterized by repetitive episodes or perceptions of the ankle giving way, ongoing symptoms such as pain, weakness, or reduced ankle range of motion, diminished self-reported function, and recurrent ankle sprains that persist for more than one year after the initial injury. And this characterization was largely influenced by a position statement of the International Ankle Consortium by Gribble et al. in 2014. And in that paper, they define ankle sprain and recurrent sprain and what giving way means. So it doesn't mean that we can't argue any of these definitions or this characterization um, by Hurdle and Corbett, but these papers make discussions and research about chronic ankle instability, a little more homogenous, understandable, reproducible. As it relates to the shoulder, if you've ever heard of clinicians label issues into different categories like a stiff shoulder relating to frozen shoulder or you know osteoarthritis or an unstable shoulder, this was largely popularized by Philip McClure and Lori Mishner in a 2015 paper titled Staged Approach for Rehabilitation Classification, Shoulder Disorders, 
And we've had Lori on the podcast really early on to discuss this paper. She's one of my longtime uh, mentors. But for the instability bucket, they keep it super simple. History of dislocation or subluxation, positive apprehension test, positive relocation test, and generalized laxity. And then the key negative findings to rule out glenohumeral instability would be no history of dislocation or subluxation and no apprehension with testing. So once again, we could argue this and go into way more depth, but I think there'd be more agreement among clinicians as it relates to those descriptions of the ankle and shoulder, whereas as we spent an entire episode talking about the other week, we don't really have that for the core. So I don't know if you have anything you want to add there or if you just want to get into today's discussion. No, thanks for providing that clarity. And we can jump straight in to leg extensions and this common belief that they are bad for your knees or bad for your ACL or a variety of other things. So let's start with the main question. Mark, are leg extensions bad for your knees? So hopefully longtime listeners know that I'm not a big fan of dichotomies, especially with such little context. If I have to dichotomize, I'll lean towards no. So we can thank everybody for listening and uh, we hope you enjoyed the episode. Yeah, that's all we need to talk about. What? So obviously there needs to be nuance and there's gray within all of this, but what are the common things that are explained as to why people should not perform leg extensions? And where did these maybe beliefs initially come from, if you know? So I think the two main ones would be that they cause too much stress on the knees and we'll kind of get into what stress means and that they're harmful for the ACL, potentially for a healthy ACL. You know, maybe we're talking about an ACL reconstruction as it relates to lengthening the graft or joint laxity or, you know, creating instability. And then on top of that, why would you do them? Because they're not functional. As far as where these beliefs came from, I honestly don't know. I don't know if we can trace it back to a single person, especially since it depends on which of these topics that we're referring to. Do you have any idea where these came from? No, I have no idea. I, I tried to do a brief search yesterday in preparation for this episode, and you know, I, I spent five minutes and I couldn't find anything, and I wasn't going to spend more time than that. Yeah. So you mentioned some of the common mm, beliefs of why people shouldn't be doing them. What, going into a leg extension itself, what is actually occurring during a leg extension? And then maybe we can chat about stress and the stresses it's placing on the structures involved. Um, what do you mean? Like, is it just like the, your quads are working, your knees extending? Like, is that essentially what you're interested in in knowing? Or like, yeah, describing? exactly. So you're performing a leg extension. What are, let's get more specific. What are the stresses placed upon the quadriceps, the patellofemoral joint, the ACL? We can start there. Yeah, if we're keeping it, let's keep it super, super simple. And I'm going to try to keep it super simple for everything. But your quads are the only muscles that extend the knee, that straighten the knee. So when you're doing a leg extension, you're working your quads, right? Your quads go from your thigh and, you know, rectus femoris obviously goes up to the hip, attaches to the tibia, your shin bone via the patellar tendon. And in a leg extension, I think most of what we're going to talk about is just assuming that we're using a machine. You could do it using like a, a cuff weight and understanding that the machine is providing like an external flexion moment, meaning that if you were sitting on a machine and you actually started at the end range of the machine, so your legs are completely straight, that machine is acting to flex your knee right? And your quads are acting to extend your knee to counteract that force. It's a little bit different if you're just using body weight or like a cuff weight, because at the bottom of a movement or throughout the movement, the resistance is going to change, you know, because like if you're just sitting, if someone's sitting, listening to this, your quads 
aren't working at all. And even if you extend your knee, you know, two degrees, they're not working that hard because the resistance in this case would be your, your shin, right? And until your shin is perpendicular with gravity, your quads aren't working that hard. Whereas with the machine, kind of a start, as soon as you start pushing, you know, your quads are working. But we'll probably get into that a little bit as it relates to the patellofemoral joint stress, because there is a paper where they look at, you know, machine uh, versus like a cuff weight versus a squat. I don't know if that's what you're looking for in terms of like what's happening in terms of leg extension. Yeah, no, that was what I was looking for. And then if you feel like it's appropriate, maybe to differentiate the, that type of activity versus what would be occurring with these compound multi-joint movements like squats, leg press, et cetera, how other tissues become involved. You can't constrain them like a leg extension. Yeah, so let's let's break it down into the two primary topics to start with, like the stress topic, and then what's happening at the ACL, right? Because there's the two arguments for why leg extensions are bad or dangerous. It's one that causes too much stress, and then the other one is that it's bad for the ACL. Maybe there's something else. I don't know. But let's start with stress. So, if someone says that leg extensions create too much stress at the knee, what do they mean? And if I asked them what they meant, I'm actually not confident that most people would be able to provide a clear explanation of what too much stress at the knee means. So the knee consists of two joints, the tibiofemoral joint and the patellofemoral joint. Tibiofemoral joint is where the femur, thigh bone, you know, articulates or connects with the tibia and the shin bone. The patellofemoral joint is where the patella or the kneecap articulates with the femur. When we're talking about stress, the patellofemoral joint is the joint of interest here. So we're focusing on the patellofemoral joint as it relates to stress. So what is the equation for stress? Stress equals force over area. Stress equals force over area or force divided by area. Now, what stress are we talking about? The patellofemoral joint stress. The force that we're talking about is the patellofemoral joint reaction force, which I'll get into. And the area that we're talking about is the patellofemoral joint contact area. So patellofemoral joint stress equals patellofemoral joint reaction force over or divided by patellofemoral joint contact area. I'm going to not use patellofemoral joint for every time I say stress or contact area because it's just going to add to the length of this conversation. So the contact area refers to the amount that the patella articulates with the femur and is largely dependent on the degree of knee flexion. So where that um, patella is going to contact on the femur, how much it contacts, there's different research, it's going to vary. We're keeping it simple. For simplicity, the contact area is smaller between zero to 30 degrees of knee flexion. So when your knee is straighter, there's less contact between the patella and the femur. And then it's larger between 60 to 90 degrees of knee flexion. So it's larger when the knee is bent. So less contact area, knee straighter, more contact area, and the knee is bent. Oversimplification, it works for our conversation. So if we return to our equation, stress equals reaction force over contact area. If the reaction force theoretically remained the same throughout the entire range of motion, we would expect more stress towards terminal knee extension due to a smaller contact area, right? You have a force, you divide that by a smaller number, you're going to get more stress. Versus if you have that same force at 60 to 90 degrees of knee flexion, there's a larger contact area, so that stress is going to be less. So if we use arbitrary numbers, the force is 100. No units, it's just 100. We're going to keep it constant. When the knee is straight, we're going to say the contact area is 10. It's a small number, the knee is straight. So the stress is 10 because 100 divided by 10 equals 10. When the knee is bent, the contact area is 20. 
because we're going to say it's greater contact area when the knee is bent. Therefore, the joint stress is five because 100 divided by 20 is five. So less stress given the same amount of force when the knee is bent compared to the knee being straight. So the amount of knee flexion affects the contact area. What influences the patellofemoral joint reaction force? Two things, the knee flexion angle and the quadriceps muscle force. For simplicity, we're just going to focus on the quadriceps. So the harder the quads contract, the greater that reaction force, and therefore more patellofemoral joint stress. And I think we're going to talk about this as it relates to the research later, but I'll give another oversimplified example. So if you were to think about holding the bottom of a squat, the quads are working a decent amount. So there's going to be moderate patellofemoral joint reaction forces, right? Because it's equivalent to how much the quads are working. So quads are working decent amount, decent joint reaction force. However, there's more patellofemoral contact area. So if we divide that moderate force by the large contact area, stress probably isn't too high. Now, if we were to think about you sitting in your chair and holding your leg out straight, the quads aren't working that hard, I hope. So the reaction forces are probably on the lower side because it's just a body weight leg extension. This time though, you know, the contact area is smaller than when the knee was bent because the knee is straight. So overall, less force, but also less contact area, you know, but it's body weight. So maybe relatively not a lot of stress, but that's how we're thinking about this stress equation. So quads contract harder, more force, knee is straighter, less contact area, knee is bent, more contact area. We would think that a strong quad contraction with a straight knee would be higher stress. Okay, before moving on to the ACL, you're the voice of reason here for the people or the voice of the people. Anything that I need to clarify, because like I said, I beforehand, I said that this could get a little bit murky, especially, especially trying to describe this in an audio format. No, I think that last summary makes sense. And I'm glad you started with trying to define and have people picture stress throughout the motion and then compare it to a squat. So no questions there. Go ACL. Is that where you want to go with this? Yeah, we'll do that. And Surely. just for clarification, like in podcasts and YouTube videos, I'll often use words like strength and stress and whatever else, very like colloquially, I suppose, just to describe, and I'll probably do that with some of the things that we talk about today. But if, if we're talking about the research and we're saying that leg extensions are bad because of too much stress, I do think it's important to define stress and understand what stress is. So ACL, I think we can keep quick and simple. So the quadricep muscles attach to the tibia, and when they contract, they pull the tibia forward, which is known as anterior tibial translation. If you make two fists, I don't know if you can see me here, if you make two fists and slightly slide your bottom fist forward, that's your quadriceps contracting. Now, if you were to slide that bottom fist backward, that's your ACL resisting that anterior tibial translation. And then the straighter your knee is, the better the leverage the quadriceps have to pull the tibia forward. So oversimplification here, quads contract, they pull the tibia forward. ACL, yes, I know it has different bundles and fibers, and but some, some uh, simplest terms, it's going to resist that anterior tibial translation. Okay, so staying on the ACL uh, topic, one of these common misconceptions is there's a risk to the ACL, a new ACL graft, potentially, if someone gets an ACL reconstruction. Are these leg extensions, whether, like you mentioned, on a lower load with just the body weight of the leg or an ankle weight or resisted in a leg extension machine, are they inherently harmful to the graft uh, or to the new ACL? I think a, a big problem, an underlying problem 
is that leg extensions, much like other exercises in the fitness space, whether it's an upright row or a Jefferson curl or, you know, whatever it may be, behind the neck pull downs, is that they're found guilty until proven innocent. And, you know, we're, we're on this podcast to defend them when I don't think there's any research to suggest that we need to defend them, but that's what we're here doing. So the question is, is there any risk to injuring the new ACL graft? Yeah. Is there a risk of lengthening the graft or creating some undue harm either in the early stages or throughout the rehab process for this new graft? Yeah, let's take it from two different perspectives. So as far as I'm aware, there's not research implementing leg extensions immediately after an ACL reconstruction. All the research that I know, the soonest that they implement leg extensions after an ACL reconstruction is at the four week mark. And so as far as I'm aware, based on that research, I don't know of you know, the research demonstrating that leg extensions lengthen the graft, increase joint laxity, or lead to worse long-term outcomes. If anything, research shows the opposite. Once again, that's starting at four weeks. Now, if we were to consider the strain that a body weight leg extension places on the ACL compared to some other activities that people normally perform after an ACL reconstruction, there's research comparing those strain rates. So I have a paper pulled up by uh, Escamilla et al. And this is in 2012, I believe. And the title is, uh, yeah, 2012, JOSPT, Anterior Cruciate Ligament Strain and Tensile Forces for Weight-Bearing and Non-Weight-Bearing Exercises, a Guide to Exercise Selection. It's a clinical commentary, but they kind of pull all the data from the different papers that have looked at non-weight-bearing and weight-bearing exercises and like the ACL strain or the peak ACL force. And so we can look at some of these and I'm zooming in on this paper for myself. And as an example, they have dynamic seated knee extension. So between zero and 90 degrees of knee flexion without external resistance. And this is by a paper by Bain and et al. The ACL strain is 2.8%, and that was at a knee flexion angle of 10 degrees. So as we mentioned, the closer you get to straight, generally, the more strain on the ACL. But if you compare that to a Lachman's test, which many surgeons and PTs do after an ACL reconstruction, the ACL strain percentage is 3.7%. So the body weight knee extension was 2.8%. The Lachman is 3.8. You know, there's also examples for walking and squatting. And so just from those examples alone, I'm trying to find the walking numbers, but from those examples alone, like a, just a body weight leg extension is not creating more strain on the ACL than, you know, some of these other activities that we do. I think we can talk about whether it would be safe to start you know, day one, full range of motion. Uh, but I think that might lead into your other questions. So did I answer that question thoroughly enough? I'm not sure if I did. Yeah, well, I think you had mentioned that there's not really any evidence that you're aware of in, in immediately implementing leg extensions from the zero to four week mark, especially in a loaded manner. And the concern ultimately for lengthening of the graft you're alluding to most activities, even the test of the ACL integrity, like a Lachman, but day-to-day -day activities like walking, um, getting up and down from the chair or going downstairs, that may have the same amount, if not more stress on the ACL than a leg extension. So yeah, I think you answered the question. And alluding to this, is it safe to be when, at what point is it safe to begin performing leg extensions? Do you have an idea of, from a research perspective, is there is a point along the rehab, is it too soon? Is it 
unknown. What are your thoughts there? So once again, if we purely base this on research and long-term outcomes based on research, we could competently say four weeks. So up until very recently, what some papers did was that at the four week mark, they would implement partial range of motion leg extensions. So partial being between like um, 90 and 40 or 90 and 45 degrees of knee flexion, because beyond that is when the strain on the ACL significantly increases. So at four weeks, they would do this partial range of motion. And then at 12 weeks is when generally, so the three month mark is when they would start to implement full range of motion. So we could say from those papers at four weeks, if you started partial range of motion between 90 and 40, 90 and 45 degrees, and then by three months, you did full range of motion, not going to lead to worse outcomes, not going to lead to lengthening of the graph, not going to lead to joint laxity. And there's this systematic review by, I think it's Perryman at all in 2018. That might also be JOSPT. And then there was a recent paper where they started implementing, I don't have the author um, off the top of my head here, but a recent paper where they implemented full range of motion at four weeks and same thing, no, you know, negative outcome. So based on that, we could say, hey, at four weeks, probably safe to do full range of motion. Now, I'm of the opinion that leg extensions should be executed immediately, day one post-op. And we have good research by Bainan in 1995 that shows that isometrics between 90 and 60 degrees of knee flexion, I think he just tests like 90 and 60 degrees of knee flexion, but they do it at 80% intensity. But those isometrics at 90 and 60 degrees of knee flexion place zero strain on the ACL. So we can say that if we're worried about straining the ACL, potentially harming the ACL, well, if you perform isometrics or even a shortened range of motion within that range of motion, it's going to put no strain on the ACL. And I might even say, you know, so this recent research shows, hey, we can do full range of motion at four weeks if we want to. I think it's good. And I think it answers the question of whether or not we can and, and we can do it safely. But I don't think it answers the question of whether or not we should. So I know that, and I'm not saying that from the, the standpoint of harming the ACL. I know that the push has been like, hey, let's get leg extensions going and do full range of motion as quickly as possible to restore function. But I might argue, can we actually get more from the exercise by doing it in a shortened range of motion in terms of a strength perspective and a hypertrophy perspective. So yeah, although we can at four weeks, like I'm, I'm not opposed to staying within that 90 or 60 degree, you know, uh, knee flexion angle. I think, so there was an, if it was an editorial, might've been an editorial, uh, Brian Norin and Lynn Snyder Mackler in 2020, JOSPT, Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf? Open chain exercises after ACL reconstruction. And if anybody knows Lynn Snyder Mackler, she's like a, you know, behemoth in this area of research and in this field. And I think their protocol, they might start implementing. And I don't want to misquote it, but I think they might, because it's, it's actually free online, but I think they might start implementing full range of motion um, pretty early, if not right away. And the argument there might be like, listen, if you take somebody post-op day one and you have them do a body weight leg extension, like you're not going to get them in a machine and load up that machine and max them out. They're going to be limited by inhibition. They're going to be limited by pain. They're going to be limited by swelling. So I think sometimes too, you know, we say that this exercise is bad without taking this other context um, in mind, you know, knowing that someone who's post-op ACL reconstruction is not even going to be able to load up, you know, a leg extension machine. Um, so that, 
I don't, I don't know what you want to talk about from there in terms of isometric, short range of motion, the research. Yeah, that covered a good amount of it. The, yeah, like you said, the reality is even if you tried within the first few weeks, they may just not have the range or the, the tolerance or the, the irritability may be too high. But at least in the clinic that I'm at, we'll immediately introduce uh, either active assistive range open chain like at edge of table just with the weight of the leg and maybe some manual assist and then eventually introduce some like 90 or 60 degree isometrics with stim for like 45 30 seconds as much as they can tolerate and then over the next few weeks as range improves and as tolerance improves the intensity of those isometrics increases and then because through this kind of isotonic position that it's so weak we'll introduce bfr and we may do um higher reps to try to preserve as much um muscle as possible and then eventually lean more towards getting them on a true leg extension and once they can tolerate it have some progressive loading from there but in the early stages it's can we jump into isometrics at 60 or 90 degrees and can we ramp that up and get the quad to actually wake up in addition to just having them feel comfortable kick through a full range, either with body weight or some assistance within the first week or two. And I think I want to highlight two words that you use there, and that's range or range of motion and tolerance. So you're not saying that you're getting them to do these leg extensions with the intention of, you know increasing their peak force or their rate of force development early on you know like you're trying to improve their tolerance to knee extension and so these individuals are going to be pushing into that band or belt or your hand with intolerance like you don't want to cause a flare-up right you're not trying to increase significant swelling if anything hopefully by contracting the quads and you know having it function better, it's going to uh, reduce or minimize swelling. But I think that's a big point too, is that, yeah, you know, like if, if we take a squat and someone's doing like a little mini squat after an ACL reconstruction, you know, no one is arguing that that person is going to, or worry about that person throwing a barbell on that patient's back and loading them up. Like we just know it's not realistic, but for some reason, when it comes to the leg extension, that's kind kind of the visual that we have in our heads is that we're going to start loading them up as soon as possible and, you know, put it at risk. I just, once again, as I was kind of preparing for today, I read a paper that I hadn't read before and it was like a, a paper responding to Brian Norens and Lynn Snatter Mackler's paper about why you really shouldn't implement leg extensions for like six to nine months. And, you know, there was no rationale or no research supporting that leg extensions were bad. The, the argument was that, hey, if you load it up too much or too heavy or you push the patient too hard, it's possible that it might irritate their patellofemoral joint or, you know, increase swelling or something. And I'm and I don't understand how that differs from any other exercise, you know, and any other surgery. Um and for people listening, we have resources like on this if you're like if you're trying to follow, you know, my description of isometrics, you know, we have pictures and videos showing how to do these isometrics. If you're wondering about the research papers related to implementing partial range of motion at four weeks and then full range of motion at 12 weeks, you know, all those resources have all that research in them. Yeah, we can link all those as well in the show notes. The This was later in the outline, but I think it makes more sense to go to it now. A lot of times, patients and clinicians are. Uh, even if they want to initiate this process, the surgeon protocol or one of the restrictions may be not to perform open kinetic chain in, at some throughout some time point or at all. Do you, one, have you had any personal experience when you're rehabbing patients where there's been this conflict of you feel comfortable starting and initiating this as soon as possible, but per the surgeon's report or uh, protocol? you cannot. Yeah. So I think this is where knowing some of that research is helpful. And it depends on if we're having the conversation with the patient or the surgeon, because the patient 
might have that understanding in mind that they're not supposed to do a leg extension and maybe they've seen some resources online, but this is where you can say, you know what, you're right. Your surgeon doesn't want you to do this full range of motion where your knee is completely bent and then it's completely straight with weight on your leg. You know, he or she doesn't want you to do that. Completely understand. The cool thing is we can do these isometrics at this angle and it places zero strain on the ACL, even if you push really hard. So there's absolutely no risk of anything, you know, occurring to your ACL. Like, how does that sound? And generally, you know, hearing that and knowing that, and you know, a, a patient's not necessarily going to know the difference between like an isometric and a full range of motion. And if you kind of explain that, I mean, oh, that makes sense. Like, it's not going to cause any strain. The, the doctor just doesn't want me to do the full range of motion. So sure, like, let's do the isometric. Obviously, if there's, you know, maybe some differences of opinions with the surgeon, you can try to have that conversation, present some of the research. Once again, maybe, you know, you got to pick and choose your battles. You know, maybe you just try to win the isometric battle again, rather than going for that full range of motion. I've heard Eric made a joke about asking surgeons if they're okay with short arc quads. You know, so for anybody who doesn't know what a short arc quad is, it's like generally if you're like laying on your back and you have a bolster or like some pillows under your knees, and so you have a slight bend in your knees, and then you just kind of straighten your knee or knees in that position, that's a, that's a short arc quad. And then a long arc quad would be like a seated leg extension with body weight or like a cuff weight. So, you know, I've heard Eric joke about that. We're like asking a surgeon, hey, can I do a, a short arc quad? And they're like, yeah, sure, no problem. And then he just, you know, I guess does whatever. I think he talked about it in our, one of our podcast episodes. I, I remember taking one of his courses in person and he said, in a way you can get around going through a full, uh, you know, 90 to full extension is you just load up the leg extension heavy enough to where they can't even achieve full range and they're stuck between 90 to 60. Um, so you cheat it there and you can produce a good amount of force but the have you had to or have you ever like tried to discuss this with a surgeon or is it more what you were saying earlier where you're banking on isometrics you're doing more of kind of a short arc quad position or have you ever tried to get some change in a surgeon's perspective or belief yeah and you don't always win, right? If, if we want to call it winning, I don't know if we're winning and losing, but you know, whether it's ACL or other exercises at other time points for other surgeries and other joints, no matter how much research you present or how you present your argument, you don't always get that point across. But sometimes, you know, if, if you're working at a single location long enough and you generate good outcomes or you make the surgeon look good or you help them look good, your bargaining chip or your bargaining power is going to increase. So I think that'd be one thing to keep in mind. Like if you're a new grad and you're working with a surgeon who's been doing this for 20 years, you know, they might not have the utmost faith in what you have to say, but after working there for a year, and you've seen five of their patients and all five had really great outcomes. And now you start to develop this relationship, then you probably get a little bit more leeway. Yeah, I feel very fortunate in our clinic. Our surgeon gives us full autonomy to, to roll through whatever we feel like is best for the patient. And they're very open to initiating leg extensions as soon as possible. and also using metrics like quad index and um, the value of that with a return to sport. So I personally haven't had any of those issues, but I have, I had one patient, uh, she, her son was, saw a surgeon. Um, he got an ACL reconstruction. I think it was a second by the same surgeon. And that surgeon was very anti open connect chain and she was like, yeah, I had, she was a total knee and she was like, yeah, I heard the, you know, my son couldn't do this for his ACL. 
And she was like, what are your thoughts? And I said, well, fortunately, we have evidence showing that it's not really a huge risk. And it, we used to think that a while ago, but not anymore. And she was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. The surgeon's like 70. Um, so she, it was like kind of a neutral conversation. And it obviously wasn't involving her son. And that would have been maybe a harder discussion. But framing it as like, we used to believe this. Now we're rethinking it or it's just not the case. And not attacking the surgeon, but just saying that's I, that's not really the the concern anymore. So fortunately, our in clinic surgeon, we don't have to combat that on a daily basis or with any patients. That's a really good way to frame it for the patient. Is we used to believe this, but now we know that it's okay or it's safe or it's actually encouraged or it leads to better outcomes. Especially as you said, like it doesn't throw that surgeon under the bus necessarily. Mm -hmm. Anything else with ACL in particular that you feel like we didn't cover or we need to close the loop before we go on to some of these other misconceptions? No, we'll do a quick summary at the end, yeah. I think. In school, did, did you learn one way or the other? Like, don't do leg extensions? I wasn't even really touched. Yeah, that I could remember. It wasn't... I don't remember there being a strong push or a strong mm, case against. Do you remember for your program? Yeah, I don't think they were functional. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we'll call it there for the ACL. What about the, you'd alluded to this earlier, but this common misconception of isolation-based exercises aren't functional. Mm, maybe we start with what is functional and maybe what are these common arguments for why individuals don't think doing something with a single joint exercise is beneficial for, you know, whatever it is they're trying to accomplish. Do you think the word functional is helpful? Like in your, in your PT vocabulary, do you use it? Do you, do you find it useful? I would say, I don't know how often I use functional, but I'll say your day-to-day -day function, like when talking with patients, but functional, I don't know really if I use it that much, if at all. That makes sense. I, I think, yeah. What are your functional tasks, right? Like cooking, cleaning, working, but I don't think I use it that often as it relates to exercise selection. So yeah, what is functional? I don't know. Like, does an exercise help prepare you for the tasks that you want to do? What is the task? What are the requirements at the knee for that task? This is a quote that I pulled from Eric. Just because an exercise doesn't look like the task does not mean it doesn't recreate the demands of the task. And I think the word is often used, like the word functional is often used in a contradictory manner. Like leg extensions aren't functional because we never sit and kick on the field. So like, why is a barbell back squat? functional because my feet are on the ground. You know, when do we ever like plant our feet, brace our trunks and squat down with barbells on our backs in the middle of a court or field? You know, what makes it functional? Why is sideline external rotation or banded external rotation functional for improving rotator cuff strength or supine shoulder flexion with a dowel and weight? You know, like I don't think I ever lie on my back and just reach my arms up overhead. Maybe I do, but we use that exercise all the time. And it's been used for decades to improve shoulder flexion range of motion, despite it not being functional. I mean, I could give like bird dogs. People love bird dogs. Uh, side planks. Uh, you know, I, I don't, dead bugs. Nordic hamstring curls. Like they've exploded in popularity, largely in part probably because of the knees over toes guy. But, you know, I, I think there's a little bit of this like cognitive dissonance where it's like, hey, leg extensions aren't functional, but all these other exercises are functional. But if we apply that same rationale that they don't really look like the tasks that you want to do, then they're not actually functional. So yeah, does it prepare you for the demands of the task? I think that's you know a pretty simple way of saying it. How would you describe it? How would I describe functional? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I think I would lean towards your explanation or definition of is it getting what I want out of that specific movement or is it progressing us in a direction towards achieving maybe the next progression in rehab or uh, yeah, the thing that they want to get back to physically. So I, how do you with patients, if they say that to you or if they had said it to you in the clinic of, you know, I heard doing these isolation activities really aren't functional. Do you like what you just alluded to? Is that how you explain it to them or how much in depth do you give of the purpose of doing this? Let's stick with leg extension. Yeah. I think we got to ask them why they think that, like what they think functional is. And if we need to, we can have that conversation. We can give examples, you know, like, what is your goal with an exercise? What are you trying to accomplish? Does that exercise accomplish that goal? If it does, it makes it functional. I, you know, I love coming back to the biceps curl because it's super simple. But Chris, if your goal is to, if your goal is to improve your strength or to improve the size of your biceps, because you're getting ready for, you know, the beach, then a biceps curl accomplishes that goal and therefore makes the biceps curl functional. So for the leg extension, the quads, patellar tendon, you know, I'm going to, I like to refer back to, to Eric because he's probably the person that I, you know, um, look up to most with some of these discussions and we've had him on the podcast a couple of times, but you know, he just describes it as the knee extensor mechanism. That's what the leg extension is working. And like, what's the goal? Is it to increase the, um, you know, the force that you can produce? Is it to improve your rate of force development? Whatever it is, like whatever that goal is, is that exercise accomplishing that goal? And I think we'll talk about maybe some limitations of exercises that we deem as functional, why they might not be quite functional for what we're trying to accomplish. Yeah, let's go into that. What are exercises that maybe if we don't address these rate limiters with something that is more isolated in nature, like a leg extension, and we try to do things that are either compound-based activities or other tasks, is there a downside of not doing a single joint or constrained-based activity such as the leg extension. Yeah. So let's say that the two two end goals are to three goals. Get this person back to sport, improve their performance, and reduce their risk of injury. Like those are some of like the big, big goals that we have in mind. In order to do that, you know, we're gonna narrow it down to the quads. We're gonna say, can the quads, the knee extensor mechanism, produce sufficient force and produce it sufficiently fast within tolerance, right? If it's like super painful, you're, you're not going to be able to do it for a given task. And we have to ask if squats and lunges and split squats and leg presses always accomplish that task. And I've, I've changed my mind. I think I've been a little bit more flexible to say that maybe we can accomplish this with like compound multi-joint exercises, but you have to really constrain the movement and either someone very knowledgeable has to be watching that movement or the person has to be very aware of their own movement, which as we know, it's, you know, probably not always the case. So this is where the leg extensions come in. But an example is we have research by Sigward et al. in 2018, JOSPT. And they had people after ACL reconstruction perform a bodyweight squat at three months and at five months. At three months, the participants had interlimb compensations, meaning if you had an ACL reconstruction on your right leg and you did this bodyweight squat at three months, 
you're going to shift to your left side to put more weight through your unaffected knee to offload that reconstructed ACL. And oftentimes this is visible. You know, this is, this might be the example where you see like a, a therapist have their patient stand in front of the mirror and say, Hey, do you see you yourself shifting your weight? Can you try to keep that weight centered? Like that's the interlimb compensation. What happens at five months that they found is that they had an intra limb compensation, meaning that now the squat appeared symmetrical. So that there was no shift to the unaffected side. Instead, there was a shift within the limb that was working. So the knee offload or, you know, the body, whatever the knee offloaded itself a little bit by shifting the work to the hip and to the ankle, but it's not visible. So we could say, Hey, this person's squat looks symmetrical. It looks good. You know, on first glance, let's load them up with a kettlebell. Let's load them up with a barbell. And maybe we do that for, you know, after five months or six months, seven months, eight months and going on and we're saying, Hey, they're getting stronger. They went from 135 pounds to 185 pounds to 225 pounds to 275 pounds on their barbell back squat. They're getting stronger. But what we might not be seeing is that overall they're getting stronger, but relatively, you know, their right quads aren't working quite as hard as their left quads because they're unknowingly compensating and offloading that area. And we see this in running. We see this in hop tests. So, you know, the hop tests have been under more scrutiny because people can hop and uh, hop a symmetrical distance on their unaffected side as their affected side, but they're either sandbagging it a little bit on their unaffected side or they're compensating how they're co accomplishing the task on their affected side. So when you do a leg extension, the only thing that extends your knees are your quads. There's nothing else working. You can't cheat a leg extension. Maybe you can, but you know, like for the most part, if you sit in a heavy machine, you're doing however many reps, the thing that's going to fatigue is your quads. Whereas if you do a barbell back squat, you could easily maintain a very vertical shin, forward trunk clean. And yes, your quads are still working, but you know, maybe you're not addressing them to the same extent as if you were isolating them. Nailed it. Uh, to that point, even we have the, the force plates in our clinic and patients, we may have them go through a protocol of some vertical jump testing or counter movement jump or depth drop. And they'll ask like after a trial, how'd it look? <laughs> and it's hard for me to respond because it's like, I don't trust my eyes. It yeah, may it doesn't look matter how it looks to you, right? Right. It doesn't, it may look symmetrical or I'll ask them like how'd it feel and they'll be like, it felt great. And then we'll see, you know, they're accepting the majority of the weight on that other limb or it takes, you know, if we're doing single leg jump, they may still be able to jump the same height, but it takes almost twice as long to get off the ground um, to use as a strategy to produce force. So yes, any other thoughts with this mm, functional, it's not functional conversation? I think I'm going to apply it to myself, right? Because I think um, people have listened to me enough. I have a right hip replacement. My right hip will never be as strong as my left hip, no matter what I do. So I do heavy rear foot elevated split squats and I do them left leg, right leg. And people often think like, oh, it's just, a, well, unilateral exercises are great because they take care of asymmetries, right? But like a, a rear foot elevated split squat, my quads and my hip, you know, are both working on both sides when I do it on both legs. But I know for a fact that I'm weaker and potentially compensated on that right side. So I love to include some isolation. I do leg extensions. I might do some hip extension work to try to address any of those, um, 
yeah, compensations that I'm, I'm having during other compound movements. So that applies to the knee, that applies to the hip, that applies to the shoulder, that applies everywhere. To circling back to this, like too much stress on the knees, I've commonly heard patients say that I just don't like doing leg extensions because it hurts my knees. Maybe it's not this belief that they've been ingrained that like it's bad for their knees. It's just they've had a bad personal experience with performing them. Maybe we go into the more broad discussion of this mm, load management, symptom tolerance perspective of we've already established that the leg extension isn't inherently harmful exercise, but with patients that it is irritable on their knee, whether it's just, you know, they have patellofemoral pain or they have some type of symptomatic knee osteoarthritis or their post-op ACL and they have a patellar tendon graft or quad tendon and those areas are, are irritable. Where do you go discussing how to manage a leg extension in those situations where they just say, I don't like this activity because it hurts my knees too much. Yeah. So great question. I think there's a couple of things to understand here. One, if it's not relevant to their goal, you know, maybe we don't have to do the leg extension. I don't, I don't know. It depends on what they're coming in to see you for, but we don't have to force it. And maybe we do find other ways to, you know, challenge the quads like a heel elevated goblet squat or a hack squat or whatever it may be without having to put them in that leg extension, that's, that's completely fine. My issue sometimes with clinicians is that if somebody comes in with patellofemoral pain or knee pain, the automatic assumption is that leg extensions are bad because of the patellofemoral joint stress, right? We don't know if it's going to be painful for the patient until we actually get them in there. Some people go, man, squats are really painful, but leg extensions feel great. But going back to your example, patient comes in, they say, I don't like leg extensions because they're painful. Fine. We modify, we can, if we need to do leg extensions or we determine that we th think we need to do leg extensions, we can modify it just like any other exercise as it relates to load, volume, frequency, you know, reps, sets, tempo, range of motion, et cetera. And so this paper by Powers et al. 2014, probably like the most cited paper as it relates to patellofemoral joint stress, you know, they, they found that the barbell backs, so they had a uh, leg extension with variable resistance, variable meaning like a cuff weight, and it's variable because, you know, your shin is going to feel relatively heavier as you straighten your leg, as we mentioned earlier, because of gravity, constant resistance. So this would be like using a machine and a squat, and they tried to match the effort between those uh, three exercises as it relates to how hard the quads were working. And the barbell back squat had the highest like peak stress at 90 degrees of knee flexion. When you compare them at zero degrees, so the knee completely straight, obviously the squat had almost no stress because the quads aren't working when you're standing up completely straight, but the stress was much higher for the constant resistance and variable resistance because that's when the quads are working the hardest. So if we have this person and we've determined that they have pain with leg extensions, I think one of the first things we have to ask is like, you know, maybe where do they have that pain? And if they say, oh, it's only the last 15 to 20 degrees of the leg extension, it's completely possible that the stress of that leg extension at that range of motion, they just don't have the tolerance for it. Like that is completely reasonable. That's acceptable. That doesn't mean that we throw the leg extension out and say that it's bad. I've seen far more people with knee pain from squatting and other exercises, but you know, you rarely hear the, the, the rationale that squats are bad or that you need to stop squatting forever. So I don't know why we do that with leg extension. So someone has pain with it. Hey, let's try shortening the range of motion. We know that we can get good strength gains, good hypertrophy, improve the tolerance of the quad within a shortened range of motion. And we can do that maybe without aggravating your knee at, you know, the terminal knee extension. Down the line, if necessary, you can try to increase that range of motion. Once again, can you decrease the load? Can you increase the reps? Can you, you know, throw on BFR? Right? There's like so many other options rather than just saying it hurts. Okay, it's bad. Let's throw this out. 
hundred percent. We have the the Kaiser like pneumatic air resistance leg extension. That just generally like just feels smoother for some reason. I don't know if you messed around with it compared to a weight stack. Um, but yeah, with patients where they have had not so great experiences with a leg extension, one of our first um, interventions or strategies to change is to do a partial range and we'll just like stand in front of them and I'll say like kick my shin and it'll go up to they'll just do a partial arc whatever the range is uh and they're like oh that feels great I actually feel my quad and then it's that same explanation you said of it's not that doing this full range is inherently harmful or is going to always hurt but right now we can accomplish what we're hoping to accomplish with this kind of condensed uh range of motion and it seems to go well. But then, like you said, there's so many other strategies to adjust it that just throwing the baby out with the bathwater doesn't seem helpful. I'm a bit of a, an MMA buff, like mixed martial arts buff. And there's an old clip, like really old, of the former UFC heavyweight champion, Cain Velasquez, doing seated leg extensions with his strength coach. And this is how I envision people thinking leg extensions are done because what he he has the full stack and he's performing them as fast and as dynamically as possible and like full effort and it just it looks hard and in reality no one is actually doing leg extensions this way you know like most people are doing them kind of slow and controlled and they're doing higher reps like no one's doing a one rep max on a leg extension no one's doing a five rep i mean maybe some people are like full range of motion but you know, like it doesn't happen. And yeah, if if somebody had pain at the bottom of a squat, when the stress is highest because the quads are working the hardest, despite that greater patellofemoral joint contact area, the first thought that comes to your mind isn't squats bad. We got to get rid of it, right? It's, hey, let's try to change the load. Let's try to do a different type of squat. Let's try to shorten the range of motion a little bit. Um, so even if someone has patellofemoral pain and they come into your clinic and you're seeing them, you don't know that though until you actually try the exercise. You don't know if the leg extension at full range of motion is going to be painful you know, until you actually do it. Um, we're just talking about potential modifications if they complain of that you know, as part of their subjective history or after the fact when you actually do the exercise. Is there anything else, Mark, that you feel like we should touch on from any of these misconceptions or anything else you'd like to address with leg extensions, prior beliefs, what people should take away from this conversation? No, I'm sure if anything comes to mind as I reflect on this episode, uh, I usually don't listen back. But if I reflect on it, I'm like, oh, I should have said this or I missed it. I'll do what I did with the core instability and we can revisit it at the next one. Or if somebody messages us and says, you know, we left something out or I forgot something or I missed something, happy to talk about it. But I think did a pretty thorough job. Like I said, we have a lot of resources on the website, on YouTube. We've had past podcast episodes. Uh, Nicole, my wife, also wrote a blog and it's on the E3 Rehab website. So. A lot of good um, resources there and all the references. We always include the references for, you know, anything that we're talking about. Nailed it. And to just this series in general, if anyone, if any of you all want us to cover anything in particular from a debunking or addressing previous thoughts or beliefs, misconceptions, reach out. Mark and I started kind of a Google Doc of things we could maybe chat but if, if you all have other perspectives any other final thoughts mark as a continued disclaimer on this series remember we can disagree about a topic without having to disagree about all topics that's completely okay uh, it's encouraged i don't know if you want to do a summary at all you want to summarize surely yes yeah, so the we went into a bunch of different routes but in, initially mark's explaining what is generally the stress of the knees during a leg extension or during 
activities and the stress placed upon it is higher when the leg is straight uh and that's not inherently bad it's just it is what it is and the potential for creating undue harm to the graft it as far as we know isn't really um what we used to think or is harmful and a lot of this goes off of the progression to the patient's tolerance the progression of their range of motion and then ultimately the um the fact that this activity a leg extension isolates what we need it to isolate from a quadricep standpoint and the whole leg extension leg extension mechanism this has to occur for us to accomplish the bigger demands of return to sport return to functional activities so this idea that it's harmful really isn't the case but then again if there is irritability having that discussion with patients of there's a lot of other things we can change and modify with the activity and then from a, a function of the knee and the quad in general it's a great activity for us to actually quantify the deficits and to train those deficits and yeah i think that anything else you think i missed out summary wise no that was good you should be our podcast host okay i'm glad <laughs> glad you feel that way uh sweet all right we'll call it there mark thanks again and we'll come back for episode three in the next few weeks and i'll tell you all about that improv boom would love that all right thanks mark